Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, ladies. If you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I believe you'll find uh, what is a familiar story to most all of us. In a typical heroic scenario, uh, in the bottom of the night, two outs, bases loaded, David Justice on third, Sid Bream on second, Barry Hill on first, and Francisco Cabrera, a pinch hitter for the Atlanta Braves, comes up to bat. It's one of those situations where, you know, you, you dream of but also dread. You know, you could be the hero or you could be everyone's least favorite person. Now, I remember this specifically because I know exactly where I was. I was in a, a lounge of a dorm with about 30 other guys. This happened to be... 1992, a National League Championship Series, Atlanta Braves versus Pittsburgh Pirates. As Francisco had the count of two balls, one strike, the pitch came, and he hits a line drive into left field for a base hit, scoring David Justice, tying the ball game. And then as the ball is fielded by Barry Bonds in left field, Sid Bream. Now, understand, if you don't know who Sid Bream is, very tall, lanky first baseman for the Atlanta Braves at that time, wasn't very fast. He circles third, and they, they send him home. And at that point, everybody in, our, in, in the lounge is now up on their feet, surrounding around the TV, jumping up and down and screaming at the TV as though we're somehow going to distract Barry Bonds or somehow encourage Sid Bream to run faster than he's ever run before in his life. The throw comes, Sid Bream slides, and by less than inches, he makes it in and scores the winning run for the 1992 uh, World Seri- or excuse me, National League Championship Series, sending the Braves to the World Series. Now, obviously, if you remember the, the 90s, the Braves had struggled carrying it all the way through, but they won several of those series. Now, I bring that up because it, it's interesting the way we often uh, uh, experience those kinds of situations, and that's just one kind of situation that you may find yourself in. And it, and it is that while we are merely spectators, uh, whether it be watching something live or whether it be on the TV, especially sporting events, but it could be something else, we, we tend to find ourselves living vicariously through the experiences of others. Uh, and, and maybe that's because uh, our opportunities have gone by. Maybe we don't have the same abilities, but we have an interest in those things. Uh, maybe um, the, the, we don't have the resources for those things, but nevertheless, we do so. And, and people tend to live vicariously through those whom they, in a sense, idolize, whether it be a, a musician, an actor, uh, whether it be a politician or an athlete, and probably most notably, our own children, uh, as we see many parents doing that, especially on the ball fields. We tend to live somewhat vicariously, trying to experience that as though it is our own. Well, while there was much more at stake, and the experience was probably a quite a bit more vivid, this was much the same case for the army of Israel as they stood on a far-off mountain as mere spectators of one of the most decisive battles in all of Israel's history that they would ever fight. A battle that they themselves should have fought. Their existence as victors or as slaves hung in the balance as they anxiously watched little David make his way down into the valley to face the dreadful Philistine, Goliath. If you'll look with me in 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read the story. It's a rather lengthy story, but we're going to read it in its entirety together. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered, they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah, in the Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered, and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. 
and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not a s- servants of Saul? Cho- choose a man, a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistines came forward and took the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David his son, "Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them." Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the hosts were going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another, and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, 
You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead, bo- I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet with the Philistine. And David put put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then, then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of, his, of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the, and the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharam and as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. It's a familiar story to most all of us that have spent any time in in church. And it's interesting the way that we we read this story. Now, as far as the story goes, this is as good as it gets. I mean, with every story, there are certain elements that must exist. Uh, We could put them in different terms, but I'm going to put it in these terms. There, there, there's a situation that's, that's uh, presented to us. Uh, there's a stress or a dilemma that, that comes about, and then there's a search for some kind of uh, a resolution to this, this stress. And then ultimately, after some time, there is a solution found that's brought about, and then there is a subsequent new situation that results from this. And just about any story that, that has any uh, interest to it, uh, any movie you go see is going to have these elements in it. And so that's what makes this story as good as any. It has these elements, and it's, it's, it's laid out for us in such a way uh, that it creates our interest and, and draws us in and, and, and makes us, in some sense, a part of the story. But as far as the story goes, we have a situation. Israel and Philistines are, are set in the battle lines, one against another. But then a stress develops. There's this big guy, big scary guy, who keeps coming out every day and threatening Israel and asking for one man, just one, uh, to come against them. Now understand that this situation, we we can't fully grasp it, but it it seems like a pretty good deal if you could just put two men to battle to solve the war, but a whole lot less people dying. Um, But you can imagine for Israel, here they see this great warrior and, and, and it seems that nobody from the army of Israel is brave enough. They're all afraid. Now, you wonder, well, couldn't Saul just say, hey, you, get on down there? He could have. He was king, and he could have commanded, and, and they was most likely would obey. But you can imagine even for Saul that part of this stress, this dilemma, was that if he chose the wrong man, that the fate of all of Israel would be in that person's hands. So if he chose the wrong man, a person who was scared to death, going down there with his knees knocking, most likely to be killed, that he would then basically be giving all of Israel into slavery to the Philistines. So the stress is great. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, there doesn't seem to be in this story much uh, development as far as the search, as far as you know, Saul going around asking, who will go, who will go? But the search kind of comes to them as David is told by his father to go and check on his brothers there on the battlefield. David being a, a, a young man, a, a teenager most likely, somewhere between the ages of 15 and 17 at this time, uh, goes out as he would at any other time to deliver this, but he notices something different. He goes to check on his brother and to take back some kind of token to his father to let his father know they're okay. And while he's there, he hears this. And, and for some reason, this didn't settle right with David. David wasn't okay with this, this Philistine speaking of his God in this way. And so David's like, what's going on? You know, why are y'all allowing this guy to defy the God of Israel the way that he is? Why do you allow him to mock God? And, of course, their only answer was, you know, whoever goes out there and kills him, you know, Saul's going to reward greatly. Although I don't think the story shows us that David does it because of the reward, uh, David 
volunteers himself. Now, I can only imagine, and I can't imagine what was going through the mind of Saul as king, as, as this little, this young man, handsome in appearance, but ruddy, small, uh, nothing in stature, uh, comes to him and says, I'll go. I can't imagine why Saul would want him to go over against maybe one of their great warriors that's much bigger, much more able, and been trained in battle. But nevertheless, Saul allows him to go. Uh, he, I, maybe it was David's confidence. I don't know. Somehow David impressed him enough to make Saul think that he had a chance for victory. Or maybe that by this time, after 40 days of this going on, that, that Saul and the rest of Israel were just at a point of, you know what, it just really doesn't matter. There's no way of winning. We're just kind of, you know, it's a lost cause. Might as well get it over with. And so they just send this little boy. We don't know exactly, but nevertheless, David goes, and as the story goes, uh, with his five stones, only needing one, uh, slings it, sinks in the forehead of the giant. The giant comes tumbling down to the ground. Um, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And then David then takes Goliath's own sword and cuts his head off, uh, ensuring the victory, and Israel wins the victory over uh, the Philistines at this point. Now, grand story. But the question is, so what about it? You know, we read stories like this. Yes, the Bible records many stories in such a way that would interest us as far as storytelling is concerned. This is God's inspired word, and, and this is a story that God has selectively inspired because he could have inspired many other stories that aren't included in the Bible about David or about the other prophets, but he chooses specific stories for specific reasons, and he chooses this story uh, at this time for us to read and for us to gain something from, something to benefit you and I as believers even today. So what's the message about? You know, is it about a boy who exercises great faith and displays great courage in the face of immeasurable difficulty in order to give us a model to follow? Is that the purpose of the story that we read here? Is it merely an inspirational story? However true and historic, but nevertheless inspirational. Well, the answer to that is, as my answers most often are, yes and no. There is definitely a, a there are definitely character traits that exist in this story that, that when modeled by us will serve to better us as, as our, in our character and in our values. There's no question about that. However, I'm going to argue today that that is not the ultimate point of this text, nor is it any biblical text. The, the ultimate purpose of the biblical text is not do better stories, be better stories. While those may be contained therein and may be the resulting factor, that is never the purpose of God's revealed word simply to make you a better person. Because God's already established for us that even all our good works are worthless. So there's got to be something grander than that in the story. I mean, as we read the story, we find very easily that, that David's faith in God was grounded in God's faithfulness. As he tells the stories of the past, of how he had faced these situations, how God had delivered him. So he obviously had a great faith in God's faithfulness. And it seems that, that regardless of the rewards that are out there, while that was great that there would be reward for the, the victor, David's concern was God's glory. Because he says in, in verse 46, as we read, that um, uh, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I will strike you down and cut off your head and will give your dead bodies to the host of the, uh, dead bodies of the host of Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that, the, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. David's concern was not personal. His concern was the glory of God, which is most often the concern in all the stories that we read. But yet, if the story's purpose, if the point, main point of this story is to motivate you and I to, to merely be courageous and to muster up, muster up great faith, We'll, we'll probably find ourselves failing mis fa falling miserably short of such valor and faith more often than not. You see, because while the Bible does encourage us in these ways and seek to, to, to motivate us at times in these ways, the reality of it all is that neither faith nor courage is merely a decision. It's much more than a decision. You don't just wake up one day and go, okay, I'm just going to have faith. It's not just a, 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 a decision that you make. It's much more than that. It, that may, that's involved, but it's much more than that. You don't wake up one day and, and, and have the, your fears 
that you, you fear it all your life and just wake up one day and go, oh, okay, today I make this mental decision that I'm no longer going to be afraid of this or I'm going to face it regardless. Faith and courage are much more than that. It's not something we can just merely muster up because we make a decision to decide to muster them up. And so if that's what we read from this story, then we're going to find ourselves very much unlike David in many of the situations and difficulties that we face in life. And beyond that, more than that, if we read the story merely that way, then we're going to walk away viewing the inspired Word of God as nothing more than a pick-me-up book of inspiring tales to elicit temporary emotional excitement that may or may not keep us going until the next shot of inspiration. Otherwise, we often read these stories as we would read Aesop's fables. You know, something to encourage, or, or, or Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, these inspiring stories of, of hope and, and that, that, that bring about these emotions within us. And, and we end up making God's word nothing more than that. And we take the, the concept of God's inspired word, the inspiration of scriptures, and we make it what we, the way we use that word today in the modern sense, just inspiring. I've been inspired. And there's two totally different concepts built in there. As God's inspired word is means that this is God's word spoken to his people with the express purpose of bringing about something in the lives of his people. So then how should we read a story as popular and as well-known as the story of David and Goliath? Well, we have to read it in light of God's grand narrative. Now, you might not understand that. That means the big picture. What is God's big picture? Because you see, the Bible is not a a collection of just many stories. While it is that, it's much more. It is a story. It is one singular story. From beginning to end, God is communicating a story. All these other stories that we read in the midst of it are, are supporting points of the major story that God is trying to communicate. And so we must read every story, including this story, in light of God's grand scheme of things, which is, to put it simply, redeeming sinful humanity from their own helplessness and hopelessness. That is, God is doing for humanity what they could not and would not do for themselves. Now, in order to get or gain the, the perspective that we need on this story, I need to back up and take us for a little run through scriptures to try to place this story where it needs to be in the grand scheme of things. And so we have to go back to Genesis as we do almost every week. There are two key threads of focus that run through Scripture from the beginning. While we could, we could divide these things up in many ways, we're going to do it in two. And that is the people of God and the seed of the woman. Those are two threads that begin at the very beginning. We find the people of God introduced from the very beginning as God creates mankind and, and mandates them to populate the earth uh, with worshipers. But then, of course, we know the story of the fall, and all that God had intended is now broken in some sense. And, but immediately, God responds to that with a promise of victory. In Genesis 3.15 uh, is the first promise of victory when he tells the, the serpent that the serpent's head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. Now, these two threads are the two threads that are now picked up and carried all the way through Scripture from beginning to end. Now, the second thread, the seed of the woman, is a part of, but nevertheless, a distinct and unique part of the other thread of the people of God. Otherwise, it's always going to operate within that other thread, but it's still going to be distinct. And what you're going to see is, between these two threads, you're going to see the focus, one come to the surface while the other one kind of hides underneath it for a while, and then you'll see it reverse. And let me kind of illustrate that for you as we walk through Scripture. Because from the moment of the fall, we immediately see the focus on the seed of the woman. Adam and Eve, they have, a, have children. They have Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. Problem, because it seems, as Scripture shows us, that Abel was that seed. So what does God do? God replaces that seed with the son, Seth. And then from Seth, we run. We, see, we get, to get this trace of genealogy from Seth through all these men. Uh, people like in that lineage is Enoch, you know, the one that walked with God and was not. All the way down until we finally reach Noah. But by the time we reach Noah... The rest of the people of God, which is an assumption this time, we've we got more than this one lineage. We have a bunch of other people. But the people of God become so wicked that God decides to destroy the earth. Well, but Noah is in the line of this seed, and God preserves him by God's grace 
and he saves him through this destruction. And then immediately after that, the mandate to repopulate, repopulate the earth or populate the earth takes over again. And Noah and his family are fruitful and they multiply. But just like before, sin that has infected the world still reigns. And so we find as, as Noah's descendants are now given to us with a focus on the lineage of Shem, one son, which traces the seed of the woman uh, uh, from there, runs all the way up to the Tower of Babel. And once again, we see the wickedness of mankind and, and all that's going on, and God does something else. He doesn't destroy the world this time. He just brings great division among the people. But then eventually, in chapter 12, we see a focus now uh, on the people of God as God calls Abraham out specifically for a purpose. And he tells Abraham two things, two specific things. Well, more than that, but two that we're going to focus on. And that is, he says, I will make your descendants as numerous as the sands of the seas and the stars of the heaven. There's the people of God thread, and we trace. But he also says that by your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. There's the thread of the seed of the woman. And so from that point, we, we, we still get a focus. We get a promise about the people of God, but we get a, po- a focus on a singular seed. As we see Isaac, God rejects Ishmael, he chooses Isaac. Isaac has children. God rejects Esau, he chooses Jacob. But then from Jacob, Jacob has 12 sons, and all of a sudden the focus is broadened. It's broadened to the people of God once again as we see the development of these 12 sons into the nation of Israel. But even in the midst of that, God gives us a reminder in Genesis chapter 49 of the seed. He he doesn't want us to forget about the seed, though he's going to now focus on the people of God for a little while. Because in Genesis 49, 10, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So amongst all the people of God, he brings a focus down to this one line, Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, not until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Now, it's veiled, nevertheless, but within the scope of Scripture, we begin to see that this is a, 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 a focus on that seed of the woman who would one day bring about great victory for God's people. And now God tells us that this is amongst the people of God, children of Israel, this is going to happen through Judah. So then we're in, we get into the Exodus, and God's people multiply greatly, and God blesses them. And then God chooses a man, not from Judah, but from the sons of uh, Levi, He chooses him and then sends him to the people as a deliverer. And Moses becomes somewhat of a picture, as we saw several weeks ago, of what Jesus would be as a deliverer. Though he's not from the line of Judah, he can't be the one that God's promised because he doesn't meet the the requirements. He doesn't meet what God has said would be the case. But he becomes a picture, a foreshadowing of what this seed of the woman would be for God's people. And then Moses himself in Deuteronomy 18 says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So even then, it's a reminder of what they're looking for. All these promises that God is dropping in this this grand scenario, this story he's telling us, the seed of the woman, the the, the ruler that would come from Judah, a prophet like Moses, and now the focus is coming in. They're looking for something. They're longing for something. They don't exactly know what that's going to be, but they're looking. And then we get into the promised land. And we get into the story of the judges. And it's interesting because in the story of the judges, uh, we find Israel in the cycle of sin over and over again. What would happen is God would bless them. They would live in peace. They would rebel. They'd get comfortable, complacent. They'd do their own thing. They would turn away from God. And then God would judge them. And most often that was by sending a foreign pagan nation against them to defeat them. And then he'd be oppressed for some number of years. And then eventually they would cry out and say, Oh God, help us! And they would turn back to God. And so God would raise up a judge to deliver them. Again, kind of a mini picture of what Moses was in the sense of deliverer. Well, in the midst of all this, in the story of the judges, we have another story. It's written in another book that takes place in the midst of what's going on in Judges. And it's in the book of Ruth. And in the book of Ruth, it begins in the days of the judges. And by the way, Understand that the mark of judges, it's it's stated halfway through the book, and then at the very last verse of the book, and it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the mark of the period of the judges. But in the midst of that, there's this story of Ruth, about this family who travels outside of the promised land uh, to find provision. And all the men die. And Naomi is left alone. We've been through Ruth. And so she goes back, and Ruth, this daughter-in-law, this foreigner, decides to go back with her. 
And in the midst of what goes on in that story, she meets up with this man named Boaz. Who is Boaz? He is an Ephrathite from the tribe of Judah. And then the story ends this way specifically, and you probably don't remember because it's been so long. It ends with a genealogy. We don't like reading genealogies because they kind of get boring and they always have hard names in them. But it, it reaches back in time with the genealogy and it reaches forward in time. And it, makes, it becomes a dot connector for us. Because the genealogy starts, now these are the generations of Perez. Now who is Perez? Anybody know who Perez is? We'll go back to Genesis 30, I'll get the chapter on, 38 maybe. It's a story of Judah and Tamar and their son, Perez. It's the son of Judah. It's a connection reminding us of the promises of God. The genealogy starts from Perez, and it runs all the way up to Boaz, and it says, and then it says, and Boaz fathered Obed, which was the son, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered who? David. And so the story of the scriptures is, is, is trying to bring together these promises that God's made and weave in these threads and it comes from different directions so it gets a little bit confusing but the people of God is a focus but then this seed of God which is going to come through Judah and now in the midst of these stories about what's going on with God's people in rebellion and God being gracious and delivering them and, and giving them a little small taste of what's to come in the midst of that story and all God's rebellion God reminds us that even in the midst of that I'm still working on that other thread it's not lost it's still there. Now, back up just one second. In Deuteronomy, Moses also tells us this. From the mouth of God, when you come to the land, Deuteronomy 17, 14 and following, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then you say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So we understand that even long before the judges began to take place, that there was this understanding that there would be a day that God would place a king over Israel. But you see, as so often is the case, as God's people, we're impatient. We want to do things our way, and we often know better than God. So at the end of the judges, the final judge was Samuel. And that's where the book of 1 Samuel begins. It's the story of Samuel. And, and, and what happens is the people are begging for a king. They want a king. They want to be like the rest of the nations, the ones that God has told them you to be different from. And so they say, we want a king. So what happens in 1 Samuel 8, here's the way it reads, in verse 4 and following. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. You see, they wanted to choose for themselves, and so they did, and God allowed it. And guess who they chose? They chose Saul. Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. And if you'll go back and read the story of Judges, Judges closes with a very sad outlook on the tribe of Benjamin purposely to show us the trouble that Israel is putting themselves in as they once again, in a justifiable way, reject God and do for themselves what they want to do. Well, eventually Saul causes enough trouble and he messes up bad enough that God finally says, I've rejected you. And so God goes to Samuel in chapter, or, you know, in chapter 16 and he tells Samuel to go to the house of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, and we could go all the way back to the son of Judah. And he says, there I will appoint you to anoint my king, the king of my choosing. And you know this story. He goes to, to the house of Jesse and all the sons are lined up and he goes to the oldest son and Samuel thinks, surely this is the one. And God says, no, he's not the one. Remember, Samuel, the man looks on the outward appearance, but I, I look on the heart. And then after he goes through all the sons and God says, no, to all of them, Jesse, uh, Samuel says, Jesse, is this all your sons? He says, well, no, but I mean, I've got one other, my youngest son, he's out in the fields keeping the sheep. He's the one we hide away, you know, he's not very impressive. And he says, go get him. And he brings him. And the Bible tells us that God says, he's the one. And so he tells Samuel to anoint him king over Israel. 
And Samuel obeys and he does that. Now understand that the Hebrew word for anointed one, you may know it. It's the word Messiah. That means anointed one. And so in a very real sense, in a very uh, uh, a tangible sense, David becomes God's Messiah for his people of that day. Now, the story goes, it, it doesn't come to full fruition for a while, but when David eventually is installed as the king, Israel, for the first time in their history, experiences the peace that they had been looking for ever since God had begun making these promises to them. Because this is God's man. And so when we come to this story, what we find is that David is not a character in a story to which we relate ourselves but rather, David becomes the character in the story to which we are pointed forward to one individual, the person, Jesus Christ. In fact, if you go to the New Testament, while you will find many references to believers as called the sons of Abraham, you will not find any reference of believers being called the sons of David. That title is reserved for one alone. And the Bible goes to great links to show that connection couple examples if you turn to you don't have to but if you look in Matthew 1 you always again those genealogies that we're so adverse to they serve a purpose and the point of this genealogy is to draw a line from Abraham to David and ultimately from David to Christ and then if you uh, read through the gospels many times I think of one story that's coming up the story of um, blind Bartimaeus Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Constantly throughout the Gospels, we find the, the terminology of Jesus being the son of David. And then if we turn to Romans, Paul even begins his, one of his greatest treaties this way. Paul, the servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. So everything that, that mattered, all this, this promises, that, this thread that we're looking for, it's all wrapped up in this one person right in the center, that is, this little boy, David, who voluntarily goes to the battlefields on behalf of Israel. And you see, in this story, we often read it backwards. We read David and we go, how can we be like David? When what we really need to see is the fact that the story doesn't present us like David. We in the story are represented by the armies of Israel. We are the ones who are standing on the mountain, looking across at a, at a, at a great adversary to whom we are extremely afraid of and unwilling and unable to go against. In essence, cowards in the midst of the battle. David becomes the one who is sent by the father who then goes out and marches down in the valley and fights our battle for us as we stand off at a distance as mere spectators of this victory being won for us. And so what you understand that even in the midst of these, these, these great stories of the Bible that we know so well, very central of stories are not character traits or values lessons. While those are always a part of them, the point is always always has been and always will be the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. If the gospel is so central to God's purpose that he would spend from the beginning of scriptures and through everything that he has revealed to us, selectively revealed, he doesn't tell us everything. He tells us what we need to know to show this story. If the gospel stands at the very center of it, then what does it communicate to us concerning how we ought to handle our existence as individuals claiming to be believers and as a church claims to be the church of the Jesus Christ. And that is that regardless of what we're about, regardless of, of the, the subplots of our lives, the very central story must always stand as the message of the gospel because it is the message that God has gone to great lengths to reveal from the very beginning of time, even up through the closing of his revelation in the book of Revelation in Scripture. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how important is the gospel to you? How central to your life story is the gospel? 
Is the gospel merely a past tense part of your life? Or is it here and now? Is it something you are living out? That you are now having the opportunity, while we would never exalt ourselves to the positions of many of these, these stories that we read in scriptures, or even to the position of Christ himself, we are in essence now called to be Christ's representatives, his ambassadors, and in a sense to be the very stories themselves in the life that we live. We are to be the picture of the gospel. How does your life communicate the gospel? Again, we've got to know the gospel. The gospel is all about self-sacrifice, giving beyond measure, even to the point of death, for the sake of people who, check it out, who don't deserve it. They don't deserve your time. They don't deserve your kindness. They don't deserve your love. But that's what the gospel is all about. It's not about being nice to people who are nice to us, while that's included. It's about going beyond those things. And it's about doing so with a specific message. And that is a message of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the seed of the woman, the son of Judah, the son of David, who went to the battlefield on our behalf as we stood off in the distance watching this being done for us and living the victory vicariously through our substitution, the person of Jesus Christ. David foreshadowed what would be ultimate. And when Christ hung on the cross at Calvary, he did, in a, in a greater sense, for the greater people of God, what David did for the specific people of God of that day. And that is, he stood as a vicarious sacrifice in the midst of the battle to win the victory that we could not and would not for ourselves. I pray that the gospel is... is is your life. And if it's not, then there's a question you should ask yourself. First of all, there is always reason for us, if we do not have a passion and love for the gospel, to ask ourselves if we're truly of the faith. Because knowing everything that we know and, and doing all that we do doesn't mean a thing if there's no passion for the gospel. If we have no desire, no love for the gospel, then we should, as Paul tells us, to examine ourselves to, be, to see if we are truly of the faith. And so I encourage you today, that if there's no passion in your heart for the gospel, and not just here on Sunday morning, but everywhere else at every other time, then you should question whether it's real in your life. And you should deal with that. And if you are a believer and it's real, then I pray that this serves as an encouragement to you and a motivation to you to, to know the gospel more and to live the gospel more passionately as you have the opportunity to be the gospel in life for those around.